right, welcome back. Are you admiring my boa that I got on Amazon just for this? Why? Because who do we pick for our third book? Night one of our third book. We've made it so far, termites. We've learned so much and so many good stories. We have chosen Liberace. That was the votes. A lot of you guys wanted George Jones. There were some other good suggestions, but we've done a lot of the country music, so I thought we'd switch it up a little bit. And what's not fun about that guy? Hmm? While I was on Amazon, look what else I found. This is a Liberace paper doll book. Here's the first one I cut out. They don't really stand up as good as I thought. I mean, he makes Walter Mercado look... Um, like he didn't really dress that well. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna do a cut out as many as I have. We won't have enough for all the nights, but boy, is it super fabulous. I wish you guys could see these close up. Maybe I'll post some pictures on Instagram of his outfits. Holy shit show. So we took a little break. Wasn't that exciting. It's winter. I got um, a bone graft and an implant. Can't see? Just a post, no tooth. That took me out of the game for a few days. Not a few days, but you know, not very fun. What are we drinking? Well, here's what I thought was super appropriate for what we're doing, termites. Storyteller, a very light Pinot. The only kind I can drink, light Pinot, or I get a horrible headache because I'm allergic to something. Tan tannins? Talons. No, that's what eagles have. It's February. That's it, termites. Do you like the Super Bowl? I bet on the under, so I made some money there. Pretty happy about that. Under 55 was the line. And um, that's it. I wish you guys could see these pictures, but, you, well, you'll have to go online. I'll post some on my Instagram. So we're going to start out with a little prologue. It kind of already makes you go, Ugh. A Christmas party at Malibu, 1986. I'm just going to say this, too, because I'm going to keep repeating this throughout this, I think. One time, Liberace was on, like, the Today Show. Or some clip I saw, and he won some big award or something, and they go, was anything missing? Is there anything you could change about this night? And he just kept repeating. I don't know why I thought it was so funny. I just wish my brother George was here. I just wish my brother George was here. And then that's all he would say to my brothers for like a year. I would just, <laughs> for no reason. Okay, anyway. Uh, I remember my grandma watching Liberace's t uh, TV show. They put him on in the afternoon because they thought he was too offensive, which I think meant flamboyant for the nighttime. So they figured the old ladies, and my grandma loved it. And then my grandpa would say, well, Catherine, I mean, and he would say bad things about Liberace. And she'd say, John, he's just a showman. And then he'd say, that man has a candelabra, Catherine. And then I thought, well, what's wrong with that? Why can't you? Yeah, I think we know what he was trying to say. Anyway, um, prologue. It doesn't even have a page number, really. A Christmas party at Malibu, 1986. The scene in the parking lot was one of superficial gaiety. Wow. Let's, let's see when this was written before we start just blasting off. Oh, wow. The pictures are fabulous. By Bob Thomas. When was this written? Uh, here we go. Shit, I can't find it. 1948. What? Is that right? And then in 1976, reprinted. Wow, 48, holy shit. I need a little more light here for myself. The scene in the parking lot was one of superficial gaiety. In the lengthening shadows of the California twilight, the guests in their Christmas finery climbed aboard the silvery luxury bus that rumbled mightily as its air conditioned, as it air conditioned the interior to a comfortable temperature. They came bearing gifts, the women in stylish dresses, predominantly red, the men in their finest suits, all knew that their hosts liked to, their, his guests to dress in a manner befitting the opulence of his home. They had one thing in common. 
They were all closely tied to Liberace, two by blood, a few by friendship, mostly by being in his employ. Oh, that's never good. That's never good when your birthday party is people that, you, that you're paying. <coughs> These were the people Liberace loved and trusted most in the world. All right, well, if you loved him. The ones he surrounded him with himself with at his favorite time of year. It was December 14th, 1986, and they were leaving from the six-story Liberace building on Beverly Boulevard. He had his own building? Holy shit. Heading for his Malibu residence, where limited parking made travel by bus more practical. Yeah, there's no parking in Malibu, that's for sure. The passengers included Liberace's sister, Angie, and her daughter, Diane. Okay. His steadfast companion for the past five years, Carrie James. Michael Travis, the costume designer. Jamie James, Liberace's publicist. And Ray Arnett, the stage manager. Both 30-year veterans. Vince Franza and Ken Fosler, the Palm Springs neighbors. I knew he had a house in Palm Springs. That's all. I did not know he had. Good for him, but I had no idea. I thought he lived in Palm Springs all the time. Well, I, I was only, how would I know, though? I was like 10 when all this shit went down, I think. I don't even know what year this is supposed to be. We'll find out. Um, I just remember my grandma watching him. Uh, the Palm Springs neighbor, Tito Minor, who helped discover Liberace for television and remained his friend over the years. Liberace's lawyer, doctor. Who brings their doctor to their birthday party? Fan club secretary, accountants, restaurant manager, backstage valet, prop and costume movers, husbands and wives. Because they were bringing packages for everyone, Seymour Heller, Liberace's longtime manager, and his wife, Billy, would be coming by a limousine. The passengers settled into the cushioned chairs of the chartered bus high above the pavement were offered drinks and snacks. Oh, how nice. <laughs> the bus lumbered out of the parking lot and turned on Beverly Boulevard, heading westwards toward the waning sun and ocean. I don't care. Liberace was crooning his opening theme song on the television screens. Oh, my God. Which they were playing a black and white tape cassette of a 1954 Liberace television show at Christmas. This was a 35-year-old Liberace with a smooth face, eager face, and waved black, wavy black hair streaked with gray dye. Although I'm spending Christmas in California, I miss the ones back home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Liberace being from Milwaukee, Wisconsin is just, it will never seem like that's real in my head. I've spent a ton of time in Wisconsin. I love Wisconsin, but they're more, he's so flamboyant, you just don't picture it coming it, out of the Midwest, I guess. I mean, you know, they're kind of like beer and cheese people. And he's like, whew, just a whirlwind. Um, not everybody, but you know what I mean. Like he seems more, I don't know, international or something. Uh, Although I'm spending Christmas in California, I miss the ones back home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the young Liberace said, smiling directly into the camera, and he launched into a, a rendition of White Christmas. The concert continued with Liberace in, in piano solos or accompanied by his brother George, is he? I just wished my brother George was here. With two other violinists hurrying through a wide range of Christmas songs, finally a Christmas poem and Ave Maria, with George playing violin beside the white grand piano, and now... I'd like you to meet my family, said Liberace. They walked on stage carrying gifts, George and his current wife, Jane, Jordan Robinson, the musical director, his brother, Randy, and his son, sister, Angie, and her daughter, Diane, the poodle, Suzette, the poodle, Suzette, wearing, bearing a package. Diane, the, po the poodle, Suzette, bearing a package. Most important of all, the producer of my show, Mom, he brings his mom out. All joined in singing Jingle Bells, and then Liberace ended the show in customary style. I'll be looking at the moon, but I'll be seeing you. I actually remember him saying that. He would say it on the TV show because I thought, wow, that's like crazy fabulous. But the, bu the bus passengers applauded the show heartily. Diane, now a grandmother, commented to, commented to her seatmate, Michael Travis, I hope they don't show that tape at the house. Uncle Lee wouldn't like it. Half the people on it are dead. Ooh. The journey continued northward on the Pacific Coast Highway as the crimson sun hovered over the winter sea. Most of the passengers chatt chattered happily 
anticipating the festive dinner and the bountiful presents that Liberace was certain to bestow. Well, he was like the first Oprah. Here's a present for you and a present for you. Good for him. Only one of the guests, a stranger to the most others, seemed somber and withdrawn. Seated with his attractive wife was a mature man with steel gray hair but a youthful face. The other passengers learned later that he was Liberace's doctor, Ronald Daniels. Oh. Liberace stood beaming before the Malibu house in a red jacket, white lace shirts, white silk slacks, and a diamond medallion hanging from a gold chain. He greeted passengers affectionately as they stepped off the bus, and he led them inside for cocktails before the massive windows that looked out to the darkening sea. Liberace seemed, seemed happy as ever, though somewhat restrained. His guests attributed that to tiredness. After all, he'd, been com he'd completed 21 shows in 14 days at Radio City Music Hall the month before. That's a lot. 21 shows in 14. Oh, wow. And I bet his shows were long. Yeah, and they have to do things. Like, stand up, we just stand there and talk. Like, I don't even think. But, like, singer, dancer people, they do all that work. That's why Free Britney, have you seen the show about Britney Spears? If she could do a whole show and sing and dance like this, she's completely competent. I just don't think you can. Uh, I'd have to be to do that. Different subject, though. But you should go watch that thing, the Britney Spears. It's, I forgot what I watched it on. It's one of those New York Times investigations. I think it was called Free Britney. I've also ordered a <laughs> Free Britney mask from um, Etsy because I support freeing Britney Spears. I don't really even know what she sings, but I, like, I did enjoy the program. Oops, I did it again. Is that one? I don't know. Anyway. Uh, 21 shows in 14 days at Radio City Music Hall the month before, and then embarked on a strenuous book promotion tour in New York, Chicago, Dallas, and Los Angeles. He deserved to be tired. Yeah, I should say. Gladys Lucky, Liberace's longtime housekeeper, had come from Vegas to prepare the feast, which was highlighted by her extraordinary fried chicken. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's some good Midwest food right there. The recipe was so secret she wouldn't reveal it to Liberace for his cookbook. Oh. She liked to have Italian dishes for Christmas dinners, and then there was pasta, garlic bread. Yeah, I want to be his friend. And a veal roast. After dessert came the annual orgy of gift openings. Save the paper, someone shouted in fond remembrance of mom's repeated request at earlier Christmases. Paper and ribbons collected in a huge, did your parents save paper? Mine didn't. It was an immediate, pick that shit up. Get this shit off the floor. Okay, Merry Christmas, mom. I don't need this mess. We never saved paper. Which is weird, because we saved other things. I don't know why they didn't think of that. Um, Paper and ribbons collected in huge masses presents were opened amid cries of astonishment and delight. The other guests had faced the annual challenge of what to give right. What do you give Liberace for Christmas? And he expressed pleasure with all of them, particularly a compact disc player, compact disc of Horowitz's piano music, and a clock that showed the time around the world. That's a pretty good idea, whoever came up with that one, because I would not know. I would have gotten him, well, probably a boa. He seemed to like them. You can't have them all, right? He cert I'm sure there was some he didn't have. Yeah, that's probably what I got. Liberace's gift to Seymour was much anticipated and involved an incident that only few in the room were aware of. While Liberace was in Dallas for a book promotion, Seymour came to his hotel suite in a state of excitement. A Texas Porsche dealer had proposed if Liberace would pose for an advertisement with one of the cars, Seymour would have, could have a free Porsche. Then you won't have to give me a Christmas present, Seymour suggested. Liberace, who never liked to have his gifts taken for granted, suggested, why don't I get a Porsche too? Seymour returned the news that the dealer had agreed to two Porsches. Maybe I should get some money as well, Liberace replied. Seymour abandoned the proposal. At the Christmas party, the buildup began when Seymour opened a package contained, that contained a sign, a parking sign, Porsches only. Libera Later, Liberace announced, now we'll all have to go to the garage to see Seymour's gifts. Get gift. The guests stood in front of the garage door, which swung open to reveal a miniature toy Porsche. Wah, wah. Everyone laughed, and Seymour managed to smile. Back in the house, he opened his real gift, a handsome leather jacket lined in mink. Huh. Well, that's kind of, I don't know. If you wanted a Porsche, a jacket's probably not even if it's lined in mink. 
Probably not going to be what you're hoping for. Liberace seemed subdued throughout the evening, and several of the guests meant, had noted mentally that he appeared thinner. How are you feeling, Uncle Lee? Diane asked concernedly. I'm all right, he replied. When I get tired, I just lie down for a while. That was unusual for a man whose energy had long seemed limitless. A few of the guests noticed that his hands trembled slightly as he opened the presents. The fancy invitations to the party had accompanied by a note explaining that he would not be giving his usual Christmas party in Palm Springs, adding lightly that he might be at Donald Trump's place in Florida. What? What fucking year was this? Or perhaps in Madrid, or even in Hawaii with Imelda and Fernando Marcos counting her shoes. The invitation indicated that the party would end at 10.30, and it did. Liberace hugged each of his guests before they re-entered the bus for the journey back to Los Angeles. He stood in the driveway waving to them as they... Uh, as the driver wheeled on the Pacific Coast Highway. Tito Minor was worried. She had visited Liberace at Thanksgiving in Palm Springs and she had been concerned about his appearance. Now she was shocked. Seymour, what's wrong with Lee, she inquired. I don't know, the manager re replied. Do you mean to tell me you don't know or you know and you can't tell me, she asked. No, Tito, I honestly don't know. Virtually no, what no one knew, wait, virtually no one knew what was wrong and that was the way Liberace wanted it. Within six weeks, he would be dead. Oh, that's the prologue. I still don't understand what year this was. 86, is that what they said? See why I didn't do well in school? I don't even... No, this, it was reprinted in 76, but I don't know what year this is supposed to be. Well, I guess it doesn't. Well, you just Google what year he died. That's all you got to do. See how I've talked myself into that? <sighs> Chapter 1. The surviving twin becomes a youthful prodigy and augments his education in the roadhouses of Wisconsin. Hmm. He was a twin. I didn't know that. Could you imagine how fabulous the world would be with two Liberacis? Oh, my God. Too much to handle. It's like two Elvises. He was a twin, too. You can't. That would be too much entertainment for people to handle. One of the babies was born under the veil, said the midwife in a voice shaded with sadness. But the other one, my dear, he, her voice was suddenly joyful, a big baby boy. How pitiful the dead infant looked, its tiny body almost a skeleton, a film of placenta over its shriveled face like a cloth for burial. Under the veil was a phrase that struck terror in the hearts of pregnant women in the old world. But the other baby... What a pulsating, squalling, robust piece of humanity. A full 13 pounds he was and more. Jesus Christ. Wow. I guess we knew who ate well in the womb. <laughs> the mother was too weak to grieve for one son or to rejoice. Oh. Uh, grieve for one son or to rejoice for the other. Deliveries of the firstborn son and her daughter had been nothing like this. Never had she known such pain. Now... As she lingered numbly in a postnatal twilight, she clutched the live baby in her arms. All she could do was gaze in the wonderment uh, at the brown-eyed baby at her breast. His mother, who preferred the romance, who, his mother, who preferred the romance of movie houses to the drabness of life in her outlying suburb of Milwaukee, gave her second son the name Valentino after the slow-eyed, slow-eyed, I don't something-eyed hero. Of desert adventures. Since Rudolph Valentino was Italian, her husband did not complain. He grumbled when she insisted on a Polish first name for the baby. W L A D Vlad 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 Zoo Z I U. I don't know how you say that. Vlad Zoo, Vlad Zoo. But she would not be dissuaded. When it came time for the christening at the Paris, the priest gave the baby the name Vladzu Valentino Liberace. Bam! The birth certificate, however, listed the baby as Walter, the English version. You know, that's, that's easier, right? Like Rudolph Valentino, Salvatore Liberace had left the poverty of an Italian village for the promise of America. Salvador, Salvatore saw no future amid a large family in Formia near Naples, where he was born in 1884. At the Municipal School of Music, he had studied clarinet, trumpet, and French horn, and he excelled at the French horn. His brother Ben, an uh, accomplished trombonist, had immigrated to America, settling in Philadelphia. Salvador followed his brother, 
arriving at Ellis Island in 1906 with only a sack full of clothing and his one hope for survival in the new land, a French horn, as his dad. <sighs> wow. Who knew? Back then, I would not think if I could play the French horn, I'm going to get a gig, but I guess if that's what you play, you got to figure out a gig. Well, here we go. It's not an instrument that assured ready employment. Exactly. Dance orchestras did not include French horns. Right. Once, only symphony orchestras and military bands had them, so job opportunities were scarce. That's what I'm saying. It's not like you're a drummer or a guitar player go get a gig, a French horn. But Salvador had enough faith in his talent to audition for John Philip Sousa, the March King, who had first achieved his fame as leader of the United States Marine Band and since 19, 1892 had toured with his own band throughout the United States. Sousa approved of the young Italian, and Salvador don, donned the white, gold-braided uniform of the Sousa Band. The job with the Sousa prov, uh, proved temporary, and Salvador traveled with his French horn wherever he could find work. He was performing with his own band in Menasha, Wisconsin in 1909 when he met and married the daughter of Polish immigrant farmers, Francis Zakowski. Francis Zakowski. Salvador was 25, she was 18. He had a, she had a sweet oval face and a strong peasant body. Yay for the peasants, yay for the shorties. Her parents had immigrated from a border town near Russia, having wearied the battles that had repeatedly changed the nationality of their land. The immigrants settled on a farm between the towns of Menasha and Niena. I don't even know that, and I drive around Wisconsin a lot. Never heard of it, so I might be saying it wrong. Shout out, you can yell, <laughs> yell at me in the YouTube comments. Francis was overwhelmed by the volatile, darkly handsome musician with the amusing accent and a zest for adventure. She agreed to accompany him to Philadelphia, where his brother Ben lived, and where a French horn player could find more chances for employment. The first Liberace child, George, was born in Philadelphia in 1911. That sounds like a good place to stop, doesn't it, termites? I've missed you all. We're going to make a new t-shirt. be so exciting. If you're listening to the podcast, I think I'm going to, oh my God, my bow is already falling apart. Come on, Amazon. That's one night. Seriously, I think this was only like $12. I've, I've ordered more. I'm not going to let this, this I'm going to beat this horse to death with the boa thing. Um, have you subscribed to the podcast on YouTube? Are you listening? You should be do that. Um... Yeah, I want to make some more t-shirts. I don't know if we should do story time or the podcast t-shirts. Um, I think story time. Maybe I'll combine them. Maybe that. And that's it. Still, still no road um, coming up soon. But the fall, the summer. Yeah, hopefully by then. I have not gotten a shot. Termites, have you gotten shots? My parents got the first shot, not the second shot. All right, you're good termites. You're worthy termites. If you listen to the podcast, if you've gotten chubbier, if you're older, it'll probably save your life. So feel good if you got a little chubby. Not if you're young, only like if you're over 35. Just know it, you're worthy termites, you're good termites. Pull up your sheets, are you cozy? Close your eyes, I'm gonna say it. You ready? Night, night, turn.